So um, I think it's fairly global uh, meaning of the word millennial, people who um, digital first. Um, <clears throat> so uh, in order to cater to this consumer base, which is you know, growing um, on a daily basis, um, both the banking industry as well as other industries are doing a lot of things. Digital transformation, digital first um, approaches into providing their products and services uh, to cater to this um, audience. Uh, but when I was thinking about this, I was thinking, OK, are millennials the only group of uh, consumers today? They're not, right? There are you know, different groups of um, consumers. And I, you know, did a little bit of research, and I, I, I chanced upon this uh, really great infographic done by Barclays. Uh, they categorize uh, the different consumer groups um, based on um, their age and their, um, uh, their behaviors. So you have the maturists, uh, pre-1945, think World War II, but also think rock and roll. Um, so these guys, uh, their attitude towards technology largely disengaged, um, you know, communicated with uh, via formal letters, uh, preferred to do transactions face to face, and loved getting into their car and driving around. Um, then came the baby boomers. Uh, so the war veterans, or the soldiers who went to war, returned back home, and as a result, there was a boom of babies. <laughs> and uh, this uh, uh, consumer group, uh, they were um, basically, they, they, they're the earliest, um, I suppose, adapters of IT, um, prefer to communicate via the telephone, um, also uh, prefer to do face-to-face -face, um, transactions, but they would go online uh, if they're required to do it. And then came Generation X. I always wondered why they started with X, because that really limits you to three letters and three groups of generations. <laughs> what do you do after X, Y, and Z? Never figured it out. But anyway, Generation X, uh, these are the digital immigrants. They, um, they were not born into technology. Um, they started school without, computer, uh, without any exposure to computing, but they were probably introduced to computing um, while they were in high school or later. A personal computer was their uh, standard or signature product. Uh, they're very comfortable communicating via email and uh, SMS, and uh, also comfortable uh, going online for financial decision making. And then came Generation Y, or Gen Y, uh, also um, popularly known as millennials. Um, digital natives born into technology, um, uh, you know, always using tabs and smartphones, um, communicating via social media, and using social media and online for their uh, decision making. Um, and then the last category is Gen Z, uh, those who are born uh, between 1995 and 2012. They are called technoholics because they are so integrated with technology that uh, when their phone dies or when there's a network drop, they just panic and you have to give them CPR. Um, so <laughs> um, basically, these guys are very well integrated with technology and are very um, weak in um, alternative means of um, uh, communicating or uh, doing transactions. Um, so what about the guys, what about those folks who are born after 2012? So unfortunately, we ran out of letters. So we switched the alphabet and we call them Generation Alpha. Um, now, Generation Alpha was unfortunately not defined by Barclays, so I did my own research trying to figure out what their consumer behavior is. So I tried to look at some consumer data, but all I, I could find were cute pictures like this, because they're still um, either ba you know, zero to six years old. Um, so their consumer behavior is not defined yet, but I'm sure uh, they will be defined in the future. So these are broadly the different consumer groups that any industry has to cater to today. So why are we then fussing so much about millennials? So I then looked at um, population data and painstakingly um, drew this graph. <laughs> um, 
So this is the uh, consumer distribution today, and it is global to any industry, even though I've said banking consumers. Um, uh, but within the banking industry specifically, because it's something that is consumed by everyone, uh, we have to be aware of the distribution in order to cater our products and services to attack this target market. So the reason that everyone's fussing so much about digital experiences is because majority of this distribution belongs to the digital first or the digitally dependent category. And that's today. If we fast forward to 10 years from now, the, it's going to be further skewed. Um, and um, you know, um, your, if, if your products and services are not digital first, then you can just forget about staying alive. Um, <clears throat> so um, when we now look at banking itself and looking at the different channels that is available, um, we can see these channels also evolving over time. Um, of course, we started with branch banking, very comfortable uh, type of banking for those maturists and uh, the baby boomers. Uh, and then we you know, shifted into phone banking, and then there were the ATMs, online banking, mobile banking, and now today, APIs. So something very significant about this distribution is that each of these channels uh, except APIs, each of these channels in shades of blue are basically provided by a bank for their consumers. So every bank would have their own open banking app, sorry, uh, their own online banking app, their own mobile app, uh, and their own um, uh, channels for each of these uh, previous channels. But the digital first consumer is now demanding their own experience. Because um, these digital immigrants or digital natives or technoholics, um, they do not want to, they're less brand loyal because they have so much information at their fingertips that they'll do their research themselves and figure out which brand they want to use today. And tomorrow, they'll just switch to something else. So if you expect these consumers to now be loyal or to learn your um, channel or your mobile application, then how are you going to enable them to uh, switch the next day? They're not going to want to do that. They want to be able to access these um, products and services through their own experience. So banking at the edge, uh, if you can call it. And that's really what APIs enable them to do. So banking at the edge means if you want to purchase something, you don't, um, you don't have to enter your bank details or you don't have to enter your credit card details. It should be able to be connected. Your uh, purchase, the, the application or the portal you're using to purchase should be able to be connected uh, with your bank accounts um, and provide a seamless integration or seamless experience to the consumer. If you want to buy a house um, and uh, you're looking for a mortgage, then you shouldn't have to uh, do your uh, real estate transaction in one place and then have to go to the bank to sort out the mortgage. You should be able to allow the real estate agent to connect uh, to the bank and provide that mortgage for you and apply and track that mortgage on your behalf um, in order to cater to the demands of today. Um, if you want to um, do your uh, financial um, investments, your personal financial management, you should be able to connect all your banks and your bank accounts to your PFM tool, whereby the PFM tool can tell you according to today's information, where should your money be moved to? And it's not just limited to the consumers in their personal journeys, but also in the business journeys, or the corporate journeys. So when these millennials are running these enterprises, they want even the business banking or the corporate banking use cases to also echo that same sentiment. You would want your... Um, payroll application at um, your organization to be directly connected to the different bank accounts uh, which you use to um, uh, 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 
pay out your employees. Or you'd want uh, your um, uh, treasury application to directly talk to your banking application and get um, uh, working capital, whether it is factoring or accounts receivable. The, the application needs to be able to do that for you on your behalf. So that's really what banking at the edge um, is, and that's, a, that's enabled by APIs. So all of this is fine and good. This is, this is the demand. Um, and then where does this open banking regulation come in? So PSD2 and open banking is one of those rare regulations that um, promote innovation and push banks towards providing these um, products and services that the future market and the current market is demanding, rather than uh, unlike uh, many other regulations that really stifle innovation. So last year, when we uh, spoke about open banking, this was the picture. Uh, UK and Europe were setting the trend on open banking by, introducing, by being the first to introduce a regulation that mandated banks to expose uh, customer financial information uh, as well as payment initiation services via APIs to be consumed by third parties with the customer's consent. Now, in the last 12 months, it's infected many other countries as well, right? So um, UK and Europe have really been the trendsetters in terms of um, uh, pushing these other countries to think, okay, we need to introduce this as well. So all of these countries um, that are in blue ha are either working towards a regulation or um, um, an industry-led approach towards uh, enabling banks or mandating banks to open up their products and services via APIs. And if we look at the rest of the world, the uh, rest of the countries that don't have that collective uh, move or push towards open banking, there are many, many banks within those countries who are doing and adapting open banking on their own, not just because they realize the benefits, but also because they feel or they realize that in order to thrive or survive, you need to do that. So let's come back to uh, Europe, because we're in Europe. Uh, what happened in the last 12 months? Now, if some of you have been following the regulation, uh, the original PSD2 deadline was January 2018. So we've passed that. Um, unfortunately, what happened was that even though the regulation was put out, the regulatory technical standards, or we call it the RTS, was not finalized in time for banks to be able to um, implement open banking. So what happened was RTS entered into force in March of this year, 2018, and that set um, a final PSD2 deadline for September next year, which is 18 months after RC RTS enters into force. Um, in Europe, there are three specifications that became very popular. Uh, Open Banking UK, which is, which is the single specification that is followed by um, the British banks, uh, and the Berlin Group and STET specifications that are um, followed in the rest of Europe. <coughs> So in the last 12 months, uh, each of these specifications released two versions each um, during the last 12 months. So in terms of deadlines, there are two deadlines. So as I mentioned, the, last, the, the final deadline uh, to be PSD2 compliant, or open banking compliant, September 2019. But six months before that, banks are required to provide a sandbox environment, which third parties can now come and uh, consume and test uh, their applications uh, with the APIs that they have enabled. Right, now, <clears throat> Let's do a quick recap of um, the features required for open banking compliance. So obviously, uh, you need to open up your uh, products and services uh, as APIs in a secure manner, so open APIs, uh, and, and two specific APIs uh, in particular, um, account information and payment initiation. Um, 
you then need uh, developer portals for third-party applications to come and consume and test it out. You also need um, third-party onboarding capabilities, specifically, because um, now for any of the banks who already had APIs and API gateways, they were uh, typically opening up these APIs for their, either their internal consumption or their trusted parties, uh, trusted partners. Uh, but um, in this case, these APIs are now um, uh, exposed or can be consumed by complete external third parties. So banks now have to ensure that those third parties who come in and uh, consume these APIs are in fact accredited by a regulatory body to, um, to do that specific um, transaction. So there will be certain third parties who are able to consume the account information API, and there'll be certain third parties who are accredited to um, consume the payment initiation API, and there'll be some that are accredited to do both. So banks now have to validate first uh, whether a third party that is coming into their developer portal are in fact accredited to do what they uh, want to do, and allow them to use only the functionality that they're accredited to do. So this is uh, specifically a, a requirement that banks need to have in order to expose their APIs to uh, complete third parties. Then there is um, third party lifecycle management because as you see, the um, specifications keep on evolving and they keep on expanding to include new products and services. And therefore now these third parties cannot just come in September 2019, uh, connect their APIs and then forget about it. They need to be able to upgrade to the newer versions coming up um, every six months. Uh, and then from the consumer's perspective, they also need to enable strong customer authentication and consent management in order to really capture from the consumer what, um, which data, which, which subset of data they want to expose to which third parties for what period of time. So these are typically stuff that banks have not done before and are now having to do uh, or having to have technology in place to um, provide this. Uh, then on the other side, there is regulatory reporting, there is uh, the requirement for anomaly detection to understand uh, you know, these, how these API invocations are happening, certain behaviors, characteristics of the transactions that are happening. And of course, all of this has to now be integrated to uh, the existing banking technology. So um, we're four months away from uh, the sandbox deadline. Uh, we have lots of work to do. Uh, and that's not all. Uh, some of the banks that, um, uh, that are spread across Europe, uh, and specifically many of the me uh, small to medium-sized banks, um, are struggling because the regulation is happening so swiftly and um, it's changing so fast that they cannot keep up with the regulation uh, and they don't have enough resources to allocate to watch the regulation uh, and decode that into what needs to be uh, implemented um, on their um, uh, banking network. Uh, and also, uh, if you take the technology stack that banks already have, uh, some of these requirements cannot be implemented uh, using the technologies that they currently have. Uh, and if there are pieces that can be reused, sometimes it's very difficult to, um, uh, to change them in order to capture these uh, regulatory needs. So it's not a very uh, easy or nice place to be if you're a bank in Europe right now and if you haven't started your journey uh, towards this implementation. So WSO2 Open Banking to the rescue. Um, <laughs> um, so the good news is that we have realized that this entire regulation can be uh, covered or can be done using our technology. And what we've done is we've created an open banking solution using our products. So we've uh, gone through the regulation, we've gone through the specifications, and we continue to do that on a continuous basis. And we pre-configure these requirements into that solution in order for banks to 
quickly satisfy these compliance needs. Um, and this solution comes in a componentized architecture so that banks don't need to get all these components if they want to do compliance. They can mix and match um, between what they currently have and what they need. And we have a strong integration layer, um, optionally, uh, if banks want to use that to very quickly integrate these new components to their existing stack. Um, so that's from the technology side. But from the expertise uh, side of things, uh, we have now over, I think we have over 25 uh, dedicated resources at WSO2 uh, working on open banking. So they not only work on the technology, but they also uh, take part in um, these working groups and they contribute towards the specifications, and not just in Europe, but in those other countries that are coming up as well. Um, the solution supports the uh, most um, used specifications and in a continuous manner so that if a bank goes live with Open Banking UK, for example, version 3, then when version 4 comes up, then they can use uh, um, update mechanism to up upgrade their implementation to the newer version. Right, so that's kind of good news because there is a technology stack that can be used to um, cover all these regulatory requirements. But can we do this before March, specifically for banks who haven't started this? Um, so what I did is I sat down with my team and I did an effort estimation uh, to see whether this is possible. And it is possible. Can you see the number over here? Can everyone see the number over here? It's 32. Um, so this is, a, this is a very base effort estimation. Uh, oops. <laughs> base effort estimation, um, typically to allow a bank to uh, have a sandbox in place using uh, the WS2 open banking solution uh, and uh, preferably two WS2 engineers who can do this very quickly for you. Um, so 32 days is basically, 32 business days means one and a half months, a little over one and a half months. And just to meet the March deadline, uh, what we've, how we've come up with this timeline is by providing mock backends uh, for these services that have to be um, exposed, because uh, that's, that's where really a lot of time goes into implementing those services from the existing core banking stack, especially if the existing core banking stack uh, has uh, legacy systems. So with mock backends and with very straightforward uh, authentication, consent management, transaction risk analysis flows, we can, in fact, achieve this well ahead of the March deadline. That's for any banks who have still not started this. So once you do that, um, you then have to very quickly start working towards the September deadline, where you then um, actually implement those services um, and then do any customizations required if the bank wants to do uh, third-party onboarding workflow in, 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 their, in the way that is preferred for them, um, if they want to use custom user stores, if they want to uh, do uh, strong customer authentication, you know, different factors. Uh, and then we'll also do uh, bits and pieces to um, make this deployment more efficient. And as you can see, we spend about uh, an entire month testing um, both the uh, uh, development environment as well as the production environment to make sure that the, the functionality works, the integration works, the performance numbers are there, and um, uh, user acceptance testing. So, uh, so if there were any banks that felt um, that this is impossible to do, or um, uh, you know, that they were going to take longer, then that's a myth, because it can be done. Um, finally, um, I think I've run out of time already. Uh, finally, um, what's in it for the banks? 
So this is great news for the consumers because they are getting banking through their experience. It's great news for the third parties because this is exactly what they wanted in order to uh, make their, their applications much better and more connected. But what's in it for the banks? What really happens here is that similar to other products and services, products especially that you can purchase maybe, via, maybe through a supermarket, um, you now differentiate between the manufacturing layer and the distribution layer in the banking industry. So think of any product that you buy at a supermarket. Does it matter whether you buy it from Sainsbury's or Tesco? It doesn't, right? You just want the best product. This is what's happening in the banking industry. Uh, so far, banking industry, the banks were the manufacturers as well as the distributors. But now this third-party network is going to come and expo exponentially increase the distribution layer that you had before. So what do you have to do to enable that is to basically show some love to your third parties. Provide them great developer experiences, great um, portals, so that they will promote your product for you. And then finally, uh, in terms of this ecosystem, what happens here for the first time is that now there's the ability to consolidate customer financial information across multiple banks and financial institutions. So once banks are done with opening up their APIs, they can go ahead and become a third party and consume those data on behalf of their customers. And that allows the banks to provide uh, more catered, customized uh, products and services for their customers, uh, and also the ability to use that data resource to do analysis and create insights, anonymized, aggregated insights that enable uh, them to um, um, sell them to other industries as new digital products. So that's all I have. I hope you're at the edge of your seat. Um, <laughs> if you're not, I'm sure the next two speakers will get you there. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them.